Psalms 108 we read, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. And so we pray that you have come here today to exalt the Lord. We are so grateful to see each of you here today. And we just want to open our word of prayer before we go any further. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for establishing Condon Community Church many years ago and for those of us who are attending. We just pray now that you remove any distractions that we might have and that we would focus on your word today. I praise your name, Father, for who you are and for what you have done and continue to do in our lives. Amen. Won't you please stand and join us in singing this morning? Our hearts are full. The day is beautiful. We are grateful, and we recognize that His grace is enough. Let's sing together.
time is not to embarrass you, but to welcome you. <laughs> no first time visitors. Okay. Let's move on to birthdays then and anniversaries. Uh, according to the bulletin here, we have a few birthdays. I don't see Vince here today, nor do I see John Serena, but I do see my good friend Ray Trudell. So Ray's going to be celebrating birthday with us this week. Congratulations, and so you'll be the center of attention for the next couple of minutes. Leon? Eighty-three. Okay. Great. Okay, anniversaries. We have Jim and Mary Ellen Arthur. Many of you probably do not remember them. They originally were from Michigan. They lived in the valley for a number of years, but because of family, they moved back to Florida. So they're not here with us today, obviously. Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. Let's move on to the devotion portion of our lesson this morning here. 
And I want to begin by sharing with you a quote from Winston Churchill. That may come as a surprise, but I think it applies to what we're going to share this morning. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Okay? I see a few smiles. You've heard that before, I'm sure. And it comes towards the end of World War II, and it has implications for that, but it also has implications for us who are believers today as well. We learn from the Bible that moral and spiritual decay has its consequences. Let me give you a few examples. Genesis chapter 6, we read where God was grieved that he had made man because of the rampant sin, except for Noah's family, he sent the flood. We're familiar with that story. A little bit later in Genesis chapter 18 and 19, we read where God reached the filling point with Sodom and Gomorrah and also destroyed those cities. And then a little bit later, after Solomon died, you may recall that the nation of Israel was divided into the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And at some point, God declared that it was time to bring judgment down on his own people. It was not something that he enjoyed doing, but something that was necessary. The Assyrians came and uh, destroyed much of the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, and the two southern tribes of Judah, an event took place called the Babylonian Captivity. And that event many of us have heard about, but what we don't realize sometimes is that that event takes up more space in the Old Testament than any other event. It was that important. Now, I'm not going to talk about it very much except to say if you want to read about it, look in the book of Lamentations and it describes what was going on. So the point I want to make is simply this. God reaches a point where his patience, his mercy, and his grace have an expiration date. Okay? So I'm going to turn to Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. And this passage describes a little bit the warning that Amos was giving the people back at that time. The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Now, I would ask you, could something like this happen in America today? And I think the answer is probably yes. I recently read the George Barnett Institute, which is a well-respected organization, conducted a survey in this country in 2020, and they found this out. Five out of ten Christians no longer believe the Bible represents absolute truth. Five out of ten. And four out of ten Christians no longer read the Bible. That was just in 2020. And so that's got to be alarming to us, I would think. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, we read, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If God brought judgment on his own people, what does that say for us today? There are numerous scripture passages in the New Testament that warn of what is coming in the last days, and we live in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses, talks about the depravity of man in great detail. And then in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we read that the time will come when people will no longer listen to the truth. And folks, when the word of God no longer represents absolute truth in your life, something is definitely wrong. And so I just share those thoughts with you today and ask you, what should our response be after hearing these things that I've just shared with you? And I'm going to just suggest two things. First of all, if Jesus isn't the priority of your life right now, I would encourage you to make him the priority of your life. The second thing I would suggest strongly to you is to immerse yourself daily in the Word of God. Just as our bodies need 
physical nourishment, so our spiritual life needs the spiritual nourishment that you will find in the Word of God. Okay. Let's move on to the prayer and praise portion of our service. First of all, do we have any praises that anybody would like to share? I will just mention one off the top of my head. Bruce and Carolyn are with us today. They were not here last week. Yet, I'm sure Chuck is especially happy to see Bruce. But we are grateful for Chuck for sharing last week from the pulpit. So uh, that's a one praise. Anybody else have anything they would like to share? This is a follow-up to some of the story last week. And you okay. And you understand if you were here. The mic is coming by. <laughs> so just as a follow-up to some of the story last week, you understand if you were here last week, I'd like to praise George for just being a wonderful guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, let's look at the, pray, uh, the prayers right now. And I've got three listed here, especially, but we're going to have some more as well. Uh, first of all, Bill Shoup had replacement knee surgery on Thursday, and I'm sorry, I did not get an update. Can somebody who knows a little bit what's going on share with the congregation how Bill is doing? Chuck. Yeah, I talked to Bill uh, last week after surgery. He's, he's doing some walking around. He's using a walker in the game, but he's doing much, much better. Uh, he had had some little issue with, with uh, fluid drainage out of his knee, so he stayed overnight to, to get that take care of, and now uh, I don't know, but he was planning on being home uh, yesterday. Okay. So he's doing much better. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, great. Okay, a couple other prayer needs we have here. Uh, I want to bring the mic up. Patricia, could you perhaps share a little bit with Buzz what's going on there? He's hurting. <laughs> he's okay. in pain, and he said, I can't moan out loud at church, so I better not come. He fell Tuesday, he actually passed out because his blood pressure is being very funky and his heart rate's very low and his blood pressure is very high. So he passed out, fell, fractured three ribs. And so they've got him on heart monitor that will give them documentation to, for the cardiologist to know what to do. Okay, thanks for sharing that, Patricia. Okay, one other prayer request we have. Uh, Chuck's son, Corey, is going to go in for some cardio, cardiovascular tests tomorrow. So we want to keep him in prayer, the outcome, and those who will be administering to him and caring for him. So pray for him. Does anybody else have any other prayer requests that you'd like to share? First, I'd like to prayers about... Uh, a friend of mine, Ronnie Rogers, passed away. And then for last night, to uh, Gary Cook, who passed away. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege of coming before you needs, we extol your name, Father, and praise your name, that you care for us in an intimate way which we just do not understand very well. And so we have several listed here today with some physical needs. We would just want to bring them before you right now. I thank you for the successful surgery that Bill Shoup has had this week, and it's been a long time for him hobbling around. We're aware of that. So we just pray for he and Lynn and for his recuperation and just thank you for what you've already done in their lives. Father, we are aware of the accident that Buzz had this week and even now as he is in pain and uh, uh, just dealing with the fractured ribs and other health issues that he's been dealing with for some time now, we just lift him before you. We thank you for he and Patricia and how important they are to this church body and the leadership that they have provided for so very many years and just pray for his complete recuperation as well. Father, we pray for Corey as he undergoes these tests tomorrow. We pray for the outcome. We pray for those who will be administering and taking care of him during this time and we pray for Chuck and Diana as they will be 
lifting him in prayer as well. We pray for a positive outcome to these tests, that this would please you as well. Father, we remember Gary Crook, who just passed away, and those loved ones that surrounded him. And just pray for him, pray for the family today as they mourn his loss. Father, we want to thank you today that Bruce and Carolyn are with us today. We know that there are others in the congregation with uh, health issues that they are dealing with. And uh, we just want to lift them before you, but we thank you also for the leadership that Bruce and Carolyn have provided. And uh, when they're gone, there leaves an awful big hole for us to fill. But Father, we are grateful for those last week who stepped forward and helped with our services to make them a good time in worshiping you as well. Father, we thank you that you are a great big God. Indeed, you are awesome. And Father, we know that when we think of your attributes, your love, your gentleness, your kindness stand out, but yet, Father, we also understand that you are a God of justice and you can be a God of judgment as well. Father, we live in a world that it seems to be getting darker and darker. And so I pray for each one of us today that we would continue to be that light and that salt that you have called us to be. Help us, Father, to minister to those around us just by the attitude that we have that they can see that there's something special in our relationship with you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Please stand again and turn in your hymnals or follow along on the screen. Hymn number 377, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And let's sing this with gratefulness and great joy in our hearts this morning.
Hodge that uh, took my place and I understand did a, a marvelous job. I wish it was on tape. It wasn't last week, so I couldn't see it. I feel a little bit sympathetic for Chuck. Not, not completely, because I, uh, I remember years ago, about 30 years ago probably, and I was in church leadership at our church in Alaska. I certainly wasn't the pastor. And uh, we had a similar worship services here. The Sunday school was that morning. We had about a 15 minute break between that and the worship service and then the worship service. So during that break, he got a phone call, found out that his wife had been ushered in the hospital. And he went flying down the middle aisle of the church, and as he went by, he said, It's all yours, Bruce. <laughs> so Chuck had a little more time than that. And I knew he was going to do a great job. I did, because he didn't have enough time to think that he could put something together on his own. I knew he had to completely rely on the Holy Spirit. Since I've been doing that for 12 years, I knew it was going to turn out great, so I appreciate it. And since I wasn't here last week, I didn't get the opportunity to thank all of you that worked so hard over the 4th of July. Wasn't that great? Yeah. Wasn't that terrific? What an outreach to our community. 720... Four meals, was it? Yeah. I don't know how many people took doubles, but that's a lot of folks in a little community like this. And, and what an outreach. And I always, I don't actually do anything during this process. I stand up at the front of the line. I'm kind of like the Walmart greeter. I, I say hi to everybody that comes to the front of the line, but I really appreciate hearing the comments. And now we've been doing this for four or five years, whatever it's been, and folks, they understand the program. They know how it works. They know that the church bears all the expenses and any donations that come in, they go out to other community organizations. We don't keep a nickel out of it. And folks know that and they appreciate it. And for the first time in the years we've been doing this, I had a couple of folks come through. I actually didn't recognize them. I, I don't know if they're here in the community or visiting, but uh, they thanked us for doing this and said, next year we want to help. Not, not part of our church at all, but they said, we, we would like to help when you put this together. So that was encouraging. So thank all of you, because there's a lot of folks did a lot of hard work, and uh, that's what it takes. These outreaches don't work unless we have a large number of folks in this church that uh, get involved and have a desire to show the love of Jesus Christ to, to those around us. It's important. So you may have to put up with a little hack or a weak voice uh, today. I'm not over it completely. Is your mic muted? Is my mic what? Is it muted on your body pad? Well, I didn't think so. I flipped one button. Can you not hear me? It's not working. We're, we're sending it through the pulpit mic right now, but you're, we're not getting anything from the headset. Did that make any difference? <laughs> <laughs> the button only goes two ways. I don't know why that confuses me, but I guess it does. All right. Well, that's, that's good, because you're going to want to hear what I have to say, because it's straight from the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue to take an offering in. The, the deacons, you work something out. You need a, one extra person, or what, what do I do here? Somebody give me a direction. How many people do you have? So do you need two or three people? Just two people? All right, well, Lonnie, you come on up there. And Don, why don't you come up and give us a hand, too? Children's Church. Bruce. Children's Church. Children's Church. We'll dismiss the folks to Children's Church now, so... Marita's over there glaring at me because she's ready to go. Don, why don't you come on up here and offer a prayer for us? But yeah, I miss a week. I've got to be completely retrained.
music and I flipped it the other way and I turned the off. So if I had it on during the music, I apologize for all of it. So it certainly wasn't my intent. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be looking back in the book of Romans today, Romans 8. And actually 31 to 39, I think your bulletin says 36, but we're going to continue on through to 39. And <clears throat> Paul's going to start off in today's verses and he's going to ask, a, ask us a question. He's going to say, what shall we say about these things? The things that he are talking about are the promises that God gave us back in verses 28 to 30. And so we're asked, what should our response be? to the fact that we have been rooted and we have been grounded in the eternal purposes of God. Paul says that one response should be, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, you know, if you just consider that phrase on the surface, who can be against us, your first thought might be everybody. It might be everybody. Sometimes it kind of feels like that. You feel like you're the only... Christian in a crowd. But we have to understand clearly what Paul is talking about here. He's not suggesting that if, um, that if God is for us, that nobody will ever stand in opposition to us. <clears throat> the meaning of his declaration is actually simple. He is saying that all the human opposition that rises against us is meaningless in the final analysis because all the opposition in the world can't overthrow the glorious plans that God has for his children. And those plans have been established since the foundation of the world. I thought of the, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, when he said clearly, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. If God is with us for all eternity, if God is for us in his decree, if God has called us and he has justified us by his grace and one day God will glorify us, then worldly opposition can't do a thing. It can't mean anything to us. In Luke 12, 5, we're told who it is specifically that we need to fear. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so we begin in Romans 8.31, and I want to look at just verses 31 and 32, I believe it is. But as always, before we go to Scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do lift this time up to you now. And as always, it's my earnest prayer that you would just set me aside, Father, and speak for me. As I'm still struggling a little bit with this cough in my voice, I would just ask that you would strengthen that too, Father. Open our hearts and minds to the words that you have here today. And through the revelation of your Holy Spirit, Father, give us understanding. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? These questions and the answers to them should move us to a loving response. When we truly understand what God actually desires from us, he desires that we have an unfo unforced, unfolding, <coughs> genuine love for him. And he desires that we understand that he loves us. He wants, to, he wants to know that whatever our problems, our heartaches we go through, we will love him and that he will continue to love us. After all, we're told here that God loved us, loved us so much that he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. And what can we do in response to such a great love? Simply <clears throat> love him completely in return. Give him our life. Not, not just the parts that we feel comfortable separating with and hang on to the others, but give him our life completely and in its entirety. <clears throat> if we truly grasp what God has done for us, our first response, the 
apostle tells us here is to say, if God is for us, who is against us? When we truly love God and we embrace his love in return, our fears are removed. Yes, we'll have sorrows, we'll endure problems, we'll have troubles to solve, enemies to face. But if God is for us, can any sorrow destroy us? Any problem defeat us? Any enemy conquer us? No, we are fearless. Even death holds no sting for us. If God is for us, victory is inevitable and glory is assured. The psalmist, in this case being King David, in Psalms 27 and verse 1, he certainly understood this when he said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That's our message of comfort and of courage whenever trouble or opposition comes our way. God loves me. I love God. If God is for me, who can stand against me? So the first sign that we love God is that our fear is removed. Now, you need to understand something here. I'm talking about unwarranted fear, okay? Fears that we shouldn't have. Fear is a natural response that God did give us, and that's a good thing, isn't it? A lot of you are going to be out picking huckleberries here pretty quick. If a grizzly decides he likes your huckleberry patch, don't say I'm not afraid of you and just throw a stick at him, okay? That response to get out of there and let him have the huckleberry patch, that's a good fear, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. So don't go tackling bears and say the pastor told me I'd be okay. <clears throat> so let's look at what Paul has to say in verses 33 and 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? So the second sign that we do truly love God is that we're secure in God's finished, complete work of salvation. It is God, the apostle said, who has justified us. So who can condemn us? Justification means that no legitimate charge can be leveled against us, and no one can effectively accuse us before God. Doesn't mean the devil won't try. He certainly will. He is the accuser of Christians. He will attempt to do so. And he will accuse us, and he will try to make us personally feel condemned and unworthy. But Paul is saying, don't listen to the voice of the accuser. It is God who justifies you. So no one has any right to accuse you. And we're told that Jesus intercedes for us. He stands in that breach between the accusations of Satan and God himself. You talk about having a good lawyer. That's, that's a good lawyer, folks. And he has already borne our guilt. He's already borne our guilt. He's already borne our shame. So we need to confess our sins to God. We need to accept his forgiveness. And we need to move on. Paul's next question brings into focus a third sign that we love God. Verses 35 and 36. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. So Paul asks, can any person any being, any force, any power come between you and Christ Jesus. And Paul here, he's confronting a question that many Christians have asked. Is there any way I can lose my salvation? Once I truly and genuinely come to Christ, is there anything that can remove me from him? So Paul poses the question and then he seems to ask, well, let's take a look at all of the possibilities. Again, in verse 35 and 36. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. And we were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Here Paul considers the worst possible events 
of life, the worst things that life can throw at us, the most gruesome horrors that anyone can face, from natural disasters to the persecution of oppressors to the bloody specter of war and terrorism. <clears throat> and then he answers in verse 37, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. Not just conquer, folks. Look at that word. It says we overwhelmingly conquer. These things cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Even amid the worst this world can do, Paul says we are super conquerors. And why? Stop and consider this. You may have experienced it in your own life because instead of driving us from Christ, these forces drive us closer, more dependent on Christ. And the closer we cling to Jesus, the more victorious we shall be. And I need to correct myself a little bit. I wasn't completely accurate in what I said there. Um, it's not so much that we cling to Jesus. It's him clinging to us. Jesus told us in John 10, verses 28 and 29, I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And listen to this, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And if that's not enough, he tells us the Father is hanging on to us. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. It's like the old song. You know that song? I'm not clinging to Jesus. He's clinging to me. I don't know about you, but that's a tremendous thought. Next, Paul addresses the possibility of supernatural forces, of angels, demons, powers, and events that we can't even imagine. He writes in verses 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He has left absolutely nothing, nothing off of that list. He has accounted for everything, for demons, dark powers, black magic, angels, truth, terrors, death, life. He even accounted for the terrors that might come from some sort of science fiction alternate dimension when he writes, nor any other created thing. This is interesting. In the original language, what he actually said here is nor anything even in a different creation. I don't know if you if you follow the news, it seems like in the last few months there's been a lot of discussion about aliens and unidentified flying objects and stuff like that. Uh, that's way over my head. I'm still trying to understand everything that God left for us in the Bible. So when I study something, when I read about something, that's where I go. But my simple thought is, if there is anything out there, as they like to say, God created. If there's anything out there, God's sovereign. If there's anything out there, it is under God's control and he has a plan for it. I don't worry about it. And Paul tells us we shouldn't. Nor any other created thing. He didn't, he didn't admit anything. He listed every conceivable and inconceivable danger to our souls. And he firmly concludes that nothing, nothing, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And if that doesn't convince us, I'm not sure what will. More to the point, as Paul asks back in verse 31, what then shall we say in response to this? How can our response be anything but giving him our life, giving him our love? And as scripture tells us to do so with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, and in another place it says all of our strength, our everything. <clears throat> Christian poet and author Ruth Harms Calkin has expressed the grateful, loving heart of a believer who has truly grasped the truth we find here in Romans 8. Nothing can separate me from your measureless love, she writes. Pain can't, disappointment can't, anguish can't, yesterday, today, 
Tomorrow can't. The loss of my nearest love can't. Death can't. Life can't. Riots. War. Insanity. Unidentity. Hunger. Neurosis. Disease. None of these are all of them heaped together can budge the fact that I'm dearly loved, completely forgiven, and forever free through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. That should be our grateful prayer as we stand awestruck before God and His amazing love, His amazing grace, and His amazing mercy. I ask you every Sunday, at least every Sunday that I'm here, I ask you, do you know Him? Do you know Him? Have you accepted His free gift of salvation? Have you taken Him as your Lord and Savior? And have you done so completely? Because until you release completely, until He becomes your life, until you give His life, your life to Him completely, you're still going to have struggles. I got to thinking back on my life, and I went a long time, I mean a long time, hanging on to parts of my life that I didn't want to give up on, and it was a struggle. I will guarantee you that if you do that, if today, well, first off, I hope you have accepted him as Lord and Savior. But if you haven't given your life completely, and you do so today, you go home and get down on your knees and you say, I give up, Lord. I surrender. You just take all of my life, every little part of it, every corner, and you make it yours. Five, 10, 15 years from now, you're not going to come to me and say, well, I'm sorry I did that. You will not. I will guarantee it. Continue to pray for revival. Pray that it might start right here in this church, in this community. If you've picked an individual or a group, family to pray for, continue to do so. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this body of believers. I thank you for their desire just to let their light shine in this community, to be salt and light as you have charged us to be, Father. We live in just a wonderfully, aesthetically beautiful place, but there's darkness there, Father. There's spiritual darkness. And I just pray that each and every one of us will continue to do our part to let those around us see your love living through us. And Father, I thank you so much for the promises that you've given us in these verses. What comfort, what strength they should bring to each and every one of us. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a closing hymn. And then, uh, I don't know, Leon, you got that microphone or close? Would you close this in a word prayer, please? stand once again and either turn in your hymnals to number 18 or sing with us from the screen. What a great hymn to finish off this wonderful sermon. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong.
thank you for your love. We thank you that it truly is limitless, that we, in our minds, can't fathom how far it reaches. And I pray that we can go out this week with the confidence of knowing that you love us. And as Bruce talked about this morning, there's nothing in this earth or beyond this earth, high or low, anything that can separate us from your love. And I just pray that as we go out this week, you'll give us the confidence to live that way. Help us to be bold. Help us to shine your light out into this community around us. In Jesus' name.